Hi, first graders. Nice to see you. It's Mrs. Sealander. Wow. Seems like I haven't seen you for a long, long time. Yep, I'm still missing you. So today we're going to read a story called Make Way for Ducklings. Um, the author illustrator is Robert McCloskey. And when I look at the cover of the book, what I notice is that it has the special award. We're also starting a unit with, that has award-winning books. In kids, children's literature, this is one of the top awards that most people talk about, and it is called the Caldecott Award. Caldecott. So it's named after a person, his name was Randolph Caldecott, and he was actually an illustrator of kids' books in um, Great Britain. And they named, because he was an important illustrator, and he did so much to further the illustrations in kids' books, they named the award after him. So this special award is given every single year. There's a group of committee, or a committee called the Caldecott Committee, which is a group of people, of 13 people, that examine and look over all the kids' books that are nominated for that year. And they decide which book is going to get the Caldecott Award. A long time ago, they used to just have one top award. So they'd only give this award to one book. Um, after a while, they decided they wanted to recognize other books for being special. So they give one Caldecott, Gold Caldecott Award, and then they give up to three Silver Awards because they want to recognize some special books even if they're not as good, in their opinion, as the top award-winning book. So how a book becomes a Caldecott book, what I noticed over the years is that it seems to me that the committee looks at unusual books, books that might have illustrations that are a little bit different, or maybe the illustrator used um, a different medium. That means maybe they used decoupage or they used paints instead of just drawing. Not to say that just drawing isn't good, it's just something different. Or maybe they used cutouts. Um, so usually they're recognizing um, unusual art in a book. It's become a pretty prestigious, important award. So you can also find out when the book won the award by opening up the book. We have to go to the copyright page. The copyright page is on the back of the title page. Whoa. So you have to open up the book, open it up, open it up. There's quite a few pages. I'm looking for the title page. Usually the title page is the first page that has an illustration. So this is the title page for this book. The copyright page, which I am looking for, is on the back of that page. It's usually up another page that we completely ignore. And I'll show it to you um, in my next slide. So if you see, it says first published by Viking Press, 1941. So that means it was made in 1941. In order to figure out when it won the Caldecott, you just add one to the last number, or you count on one. So when I look at a date to figure out what the next year is, you just count on the last two numbers. So that number is 1941. What comes after 41? 42. So this book won a Caldecott Award in 1942, which was a very long time ago. Um, what's interesting about the pictures in this story is that they aren't colorful. They're done in sienna or those brown colors. But I think it's still a, a really great story and um, one of my favorites. So let's sing the song. It's story time, it's story time, it's story time on. It's story time, it's story time, it's story time on. You're on the steps, I'm in my chair, I have a book 
with you to share. It's story time. It's story time. It's story time, Mom. Make Way for Ducklings by Robert McCloskey. Mr. and Mrs. Mallard were looking for a place to live, but every time Mr. Mallard saw what looked like a nice place, Mrs. Mallard said it was no good. There were sure to be foxes in the woods and turtles in the water, and she was not going to raise a family where there might be foxes or turtles. So they flew on and on. When they got to Boston, they felt too tired to fly any further. There was a nice pond in the public garden with a little island on it. The very place to spend the night, cried Mr. Mallard. So down they flapped. Next morning, they fished for their breakfast in the mud at the bottom of the pond, but they didn't find much. Just as they were getting ready to start on their way, a strange, enormous bird came by. It was pushing a boat full of people, and there was a man sitting on its back. Good morning, quacked Mr. Mallard, being polite. The big bird was too proud to answer, but the people in the boat threw peanuts into the water. So the Mallards followed them all around the pond and got another breakfast, better than the first. I like this place, Mrs. Mallard quacked as they climbed out on the bank and waddled along. Why don't we build a nest and raise our ducklings right in this pond? There are no foxes and no turtles, and the people feed us peanuts. What could be better? Good, quacked Mr. Mallard, delighted that at last Mrs. Mallard had found a place that suited her. But... Watch out, squawked Mrs. Mallard, all over the dither. You'll get run over. And when she got her breath, she added, This is no place for babies. With all those horrid things rushing about, we'll have to look somewhere else. So they flew over Beacon Hill and around the State House, but there was no place there. They looked in Lewisburg Square, but there was no water to swim in. Then they flew over the Charles River. This is better, cried Mr. Mallard. That island looks like a nice quiet place, but it's only a little way from the public garden. Yes, cried Mrs. Mallard, remembering the peanuts. That looks like just the right place to hatch ducklings. So they chose a cozy spot among the bushes near the water, settled down to build their nest, and only just in time, for now they were beginning to molt. All their old wing feathers started to drop out, and they would not be able to fly again until the new ones grew in. But of course they could swim, and one day they swam over to the park on the river bank, and there they met a policeman called Michael. Michael fed them peanuts, and after that, the Mallards called on Michael every day. After Mrs. Mallard had laid her eight eggs in the nest, she couldn't go to visit Michael anymore, because she had to sit on the eggs to keep them warm. She moved off the nest only to get a drink of water, or to have her lunch, or to count the eggs to make sure they were all there. One day the ducklings hatched out. First came Jack, then Cack, then Lack, then Mac, and Knack, and Whack, and Pack, and Quack. Mrs. and Mr. Mallard were bursting with pride. It was a great responsibility taking care of so many ducklings and it kept them very busy. One day, Mr. Mallard decided he'd like to take a trip to see what the rest of the river was like further on. So off he sat. I'll meet you in a week in the public garden, he quacked over his shoulder. Take good care of the ducklings. Don't worry, Mrs. Mallard. I know how to bring up children. And she did. She taught them to swim and dive. She taught them to walk in a line, to come when they were called, and to keep a safe distance from bikes and scooters and all other things with wheels. When at last she felt perfectly satisfied with them, she said one morning, Come along, children, follow me. And before you could wink an eyelash, Jack, Cack, Lack, Mac, Knack, Whack, Pack, and Quack fell into a line, just as they had been taught. Mrs. Mallard led the way into the river, and they swam behind her to the opposite bank. There they waded ashore and waddled along until they came to the highway. Mrs. Mallard stepped out to cross the road. Honk, honk! went the horns on the speeding cars. Whack! went Mrs. Mallard as she tumbled back again. Quack, 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 quack! And Jack, quack, black, mac, knack, quack, pack, and quack. Just as loud as the little quackers could quack. The cars kept speeding by and honking, and Mrs. Mallard and the ducklings kept right on quack, quack, quacking. They made such a noise that Michael came running, waving his arms and blowing his whistle. Planted himself in the center of the road, raised one hand to stop traffic, and then beckoned with the other, the way policemen do, for Mrs. Mallard to cross over. As soon as Mrs. Mallard and the ducklings were safe on the other side, and on their way down Mount Vernon Street, Michael rushed back to his police booth. He called Clancy at headquarters and said, There's a family of ducks walking down the street. Clancy said, A family of what? 
Dogs! yelled Michael. Send a police car, quick! Meanwhile, Mrs. Mallard had reached the corner bookshop and turned into Charles Street with Jack, Cack, Lack, Mac, Knack, Whack, Pack, and Quack all marching in a line right behind her. Everyone stared. An old lady from Beacon Hill said, Isn't it amazing? And the man who swept the streets said, Well, ain't that nice? And when Mrs. Mallard heard them, she was so proud she tipped her nose into the air and she walked along with an extra swing in her waddle. When they came to the corner of Beacon Street, there were the police car with four policemen that Clancy had sent from headquarters. The policemen held back the traffic so Mrs. Mallard and the ducklings could march right across the street and right on into the public garden. Inside the gate, they all turned around to say thank you to the policemen. The policemen smiled and waved goodbye. When they reached the pond, they swam across to the little island. There was Mr. Mallard waiting for them, just as he had promised. The ducklings liked the new island so much that they decided to live there. All day long, they follow the swan boats and eat peanuts. And when night falls, they swim to their little island and go to sleep.